Matthew chapter 28. It is Easter time. I'm starting a new series. The series is called More Than a Story. More Than a Story. And today I'm going to talk about more than just an Easter story. I know that when we look at uh, the Easter time, we, we tend to reflect on just a few passages of Scripture. And I want to I want to tell you that God had a plan, and His plan was fulfilled. This is more than just a story. It's more than just an account. It's more than just an observance. All of what took place in history was meant to be more than just something that we read or something that we observed, something that we really religiously remember. It was meant to be an experience, and, and Easter is meant to be an experience. This Resurrection Sunday is meant to be an experience that you and I have together to experience the presence of Christ in our midst, to, to experience what He has for us, to experience the purpose that He has already set out for our lives. So this is more than a story. It's more than just an Easter story. And so if you'll pick up with me in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 9, it says this, And behold, Jesus met with them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that he had all that had taken place and when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said tell people his disciples his disciples came by night and stole him away while he while we were still asleep and if this comes to the governor's ears we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble so they took the money and did as they were directed And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And so Jesus, he gives this directive. He shows up to his disciples. And what I want to talk today about is some of the things that we experience and some of those things that you and I, when we look at this particular uh, time of a year when we look at this observance, some of, the, some of the things that you and I deal with that the disciples dealt with. You know, we all deal with things. We all deal with emotions. We all deal with feelings. We all deal with struggles. Every one of us struggles with something, and it affects the way that we have faith, the way that we, the way that we live out our faith. One of those things is doubt. And in this particular passage, we see that even when the disciples first saw Jesus, they dealt with doubt. Now, I want to tell you something. Every one of us deals with doubt a one way or another in our Christian walk. And if you don't, then I would question that there's something wrong with your experience with Christ. Because the reality is that there are all of us deal with issues of doubt. There are things that we all confront with are confronted with when we question, well, why would God allow this to happen? Why would this go the way that it's going? Why, why didn't God intervene the way that we expected it, Him to? Let, let me tell you something. The Bible does call us to be people of faith. But I want to tell you, the opposite of faith is not doubt. As a matter of fact, the opposite of faith is sight. Because faith is not seeing, you, you're, you're not seeing clearly, and so the opposite of faith is actually seeing. And the opposite of doubt is not faith, the opposite of doubt is seeing as well. If, if I can see something, I don't have to doubt that it's there. If I can touch it, if, I can, if all of my sensory uh, mechanisms are working that to, to experience something and to, to have a tangible experience with it, then, 
then I am no longer able, and no longer do I need to doubt. But there are questions that we all face, every one of us in our lives, that cause us to doubt certain things because there are times when we feel like heaven is silent. We've prayed the prayer, we've done the things, we've walked out our faith, and then we wonder, where is God in the middle of all this? Every one of us deals with that. And if today you're, you're here today and you, you're saying, well, pastor, I really, don't, I really don't even have a faith in God. I really don't. I struggle with that because it, this stuff doesn't make sense. Join the club. I think we all at one point or in some areas say this doesn't make sense because the things of God really don't make sense to man. The things of God are not always so clearly demonstrated to us and explained to us because they are the things of God. And every one of us deals with an issue or some, some, for the, some form of unbelief in some areas. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when addressing one of his disciples, he says, uh, he, he talks to them about the doubt that's going on in their, in their life. And the disciple says, well, help me. In my unbelief. You, you see, because every one of us faces that unbelief in certain areas. It doesn't mean that we're less than. It doesn't mean that we're, that, that we're a second class spiritual citizen. It doesn't mean that in our, in our spiritual life that we've fallen, we've fallen off the cart. We, we've, we've backslid because we have doubt in our lives. As a matter of fact, when we doubt, we press in. And when we press in, God shows up in unique ways. He shows up in real ways, tangible ways that express to us how He is always with us. And His disciples here were dealing with those doubts and, you know, one of his disciples, really, Thomas, gets really bad rap when they say that, uh, that, that Thomas was doubting Thomas, you know, the label that they put on him. They give him a really bad rap. They say, you know, he's doubting Thomas. But in, in, in a, as a matter of fact, if we look at this particular account, even when all of the disciples had been confronted with Jesus and Thomas wasn't in this church service, <laughs> where the Lord showed up. He wasn't here in this particular account. He was one of the ones that were missing in this particular account. And so when Thomas comes to Jesus, when, when Jesus finally confronts Thomas, he's in a room full of other disciples who were saying, hey, we saw Jesus. And, and Thomas says, well, I don't believe the women. I don't believe you unless I touch his hands and unless I touch his feet, then I'll finally believe. But the reality was that even they were still doubting when he showed up. You know, there, it, this issue of doubt, can I, can I, let me, let me, let me put this, let me illustrate this a little bit better. So on the day that Jesus was resurrected, the third day, right? Now, now the Bible says what we just read there is that the, the disciples had yet to understand. When we opened up in John chapter 20 this morning, when we opened up our service, we started with John chapter 20. And, and, and we, we read that, that the disciples, they still did not know what he meant by he said on the third day he would rise again. They were not, if they truly believed, if they, did, if they had no doubt that Jesus was going to rise up on the third day, they would, have been, they would have been camped out right in front of that tomb. They would have been on their lawn chair sitting back saying, Hey, Jesus is coming back, man. I am ready for this. But look what happens. None of them, none of them are by the tomb. As a matter of fact, what we read here is that Mary gets up early in the morning to fix what the guys didn't do right the first time. Because he was laid in the tomb by men, right? Amen, <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> so, so she goes back to redress him, to take care of the body. 
And when she gets there, she finds an empty tomb. And, and I think this is the funny thing. I, I, I think Jesus has, he uses humor. I know we, we've talked about this before. Some of us, we don't think that the Bible is humorous. We just think that the Bible is just this monotone account of everything that took place. And we must live like this. But I think that there's a lot of humor in this. When, when, when Mary comes to the tomb, Jesus speaks to Mary and, and she thinks that he's the gardener. You remember that? She thinks he's the gardener. She thinks that he's the one there to tend to the garden around him. And, and, and it's like, wow, Jesus, can, Jesus lets her keep thinking that he's the gardener through their conversation until her eyes are open and she realizes that he's alive. If his disciples deal with doubt, how much more do you and I deal with doubt? If his disciples who saw him on that day dealt with the doubt that was in their hearts, how much more do you and I continually in our journey, in our Christian walk, deal with questions? Why would God allow this to happen? Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow things to take place? We all deal with doubt every one of us but Jesus came to answer our doubts and Jesus on this resurrected morning continually draws us close to him listen this is more than just an observance of Jesus resurrection as much as that is important for us to observe and remember this is more than just a remembrance this is an encounter moment this is Christ intervening in our lives and reminding us that the price has been paid, that the the shame, the guilt, everything that we deal with has been dealt with because Jesus is alive. Because our Savior is alive. And there are those always who would try to come in and cause us to doubt even more. That's what the account tells us that they paid off the guards to go and tell these stories. To say, hey, somebody stole his body. But can I tell you who would have stole a body and left the grave clothes still there? Nobody takes a nasty dead body after corpse after three days without dressing it. Nobody's going to touch a corpse after three days without covering it. So, the, the, so Jesus reminds you and I that, that in His resurrection there is life, in His resurrection there is hope, in His resurrection we can address some of the issues of doubt that you and I deal with on, day to, on a day-to-day basis. There are other issues that we deal with. As the disciples dealt with some of this, I think one of the biggest things that you and I deal with is guilt. Like I said before, like I shared with you, you know, doubt is not an absence, an absence of faith. So as we, as we address this term guilt, guilt itself, some of us, we think guilt is a feeling. We say, well, I feel guilty. And you could feel guilty, but I want to I address the term guilt. Guilt is not a feeling. Guilt is the result of an action. Or a result of not acting on something. Guilt is this result of you saying, here is the standard of how I'm supposed to do something. And when I step outside of that standard, I am guilty of stepping outside of that standard. So when you present yourself before a judge and the judge says you're either innocent or guilty, he is looking at the standard upon which... You measure the basis of how that is to be judged. So there is a basis to guilt. There is a rule, a law, something that is set there that it says you either did this or you didn't do this. You're either innocent or you're guilty. So guilt is the result of the action that you took or the, or the inaction that you took. And the Bible tells us that all of us are guilty. 
We're all guilty. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us is guilty. So Jesus made a way so that now the guilt, the guilt that you and I carry has been removed. How, do, how is it removed? He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So the resurrection story reminds us, see, because that's what he said. If you believe that he is resurrected from the dead, then you will be saved. So the resurrection story points us to the fact that now Jesus has adjudicated our case. He has already dealt with our case. The way that we deal with that is through confession. So what is confession? Well, confession is us being real with God. Confession is not revealing something new to God. He already knew what you did. So when you're confessing, you're not all of a sudden telling him something he didn't know. Oh, this is what I did. And the the father's like looking at you saying, oh, no, I can't believe you. He had already seen you. He already saw you when you were doing it. And some of us, we think that that if we, if we hold back confession or we don't confess or, or whatever, we make excuses about confessing our sins to God because we don't want to seem like we're worse than what we are. We don't want to make ourselves worse than, you know. And so we view confession in, a, in, an, in a, an inappropriate way. But confession is really us getting raw and real with God. It is us examining ourselves and saying, God, this is what I deal with. This is what I fight with. This is what I struggle with. This is what every single day I am, I am, I'm waking up in the morning and I'm, I'm choosing certain things that I should not choose. I'm making decisions based on feelings. I'm making decisions based on expectations. Jesus, I ask for your forgiveness. And so when we confess, we're just, we're getting real and raw with God. We're making it truthful with God. You know, the beautiful, the most perfect example I have of this is our children. Now, y'all know when your kids tell you something, Sometimes you, you get a little bit more than what you bargained for. <laughs> I asked my daughter one time, I asked her to tell, to, to, uh, to tell me what she thought about something that I was doing. And I thought I was going to get like, oh, daddy, you're the best. Daddy, you're so awesome. This, that was great. And she just looked at me and she said, I didn't understand the thing you were saying. <laughs> and she's just smiling because she knows. I, I didn't, you know, when we confess, what we're doing is we're just, we're saying, God, I didn't know what I was doing. Because the reality is sometimes we think more of ourselves than, who, than what we really are. And we all deal with that. Every one of us is guilty of it. We're all guilty. And so confession humbles us. When we confess our sins to God, we humble ourselves and we raise Christ up and we say, Christ, only you are able to deal with my guilt. So confession is necessary for you and I to continue to live the life that God has called us to live. You see, his disciples were dealing with guilt. As a matter of fact, Peter denied him three times despite the fact that he told him, I will not deny you. John deals with this as well. As he he approaches the tomb and he looks in, he is so afraid of going in there that he just looks at, he, he peeks in and he waits for a report from Peter because of the guilt that he was feeling for not standing up for Christ when, the, when they were called out to the carpet. 
and said, do you know this guy? They were all guilty of not standing up. They were all guilty. Listen, when they were in the, when they were in the garden of Gethsemane and, they're pray, and Jesus is praying, they get tired and they fall asleep. And Jesus says, can't you not just tarry with me for an hour? Could you just not wait? Could you just not pray with me? Could you just not be there with me for just an hour? They were all guilty in one way. They were all dealing with their guilt, but Jesus settled their guilt. Jesus settles their guilt. And he settles their shame. That's the third thing I want to talk about today. See, some of us, we, we, think, we think that we all deal with, you know, what will you say? Well, I'm not really, I, yeah, I, I settled my guilt at the cross. Because the things that I did, I, I confessed them, Pastor. I, I am faithful to God to confess my sins. I'm always, you know, but there's certain things inside of us that we deal with it. And we, we try to reconcile it. And it's not that we feel guilt so much as we feel shame. And there's, there's a difference. It's a subtle difference. I, some people say that, that guilt and shame are the same thing, but they're, they're not. That they're cousins, they're close cousins. Shame has to do with your identity. See, guilt is what you did or what you didn't do. So you can reconcile what you didn't do by doing what you're supposed to do. And you can reconcile what you didn't do by, you know, and what you did do by doing what you're supposed to do. There, there's those, those questions are easily more easily answered and addressed. But shame is a whole different beast. Shame is about identity. Shame is about how you address yourself and some of the things that out of the reactions of what you have or have not done, how you start feeling and how you start dealing with those things. And so shame Shame is this, this thing, it's, it's like a cancer that grows inside of people. As a matter of fact, John or Ortberg puts it this way. He says that shame causes a person to view themselves as a deformed person. You, you wake up in the morning and you question, is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with me? Why is it that people don't want to be around me? Why, why is it that my husband left me? Why is, it that, why, is it, why is it that people treat me this way? Why do I always sit alone in the cafeteria? Why do I always, why do I always ostracize myself? Why do I always say the wrong things? And we, and we question all these things and they rise up as shame in our lives and we identify ourselves through our shame. Jesus came to deal with our shame. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 through 12, he says, Yes, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Listen, and he says, I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying all these other things, all these other identifiers, all these things that I've done, listen, they can carry their weight in my life and, and, and they'll demonstrate themselves as shame in life. But I, today I deny all those things. I leave them at the cross that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own right standing. I'm not measuring myself by my standards. I'm measuring myself by where I stand with Christ. And Christ has made me whole. Amen? The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection. 
and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I lay hold of that which Christ has also laid hold of me. Wow. Jesus says, he reminds us, this is Paul, Paul is addressing this issue. And he's reminding that the, the in Christ's suffering, you and I are made whole. In Christ's suffering, we can find the true identity that deals with the shame that we feel. And every one of us feels shame. It's not something that we all, that we all really joke about, talk about. It's not something that many times we express to others. But the reality is that we all have some sort of shame that we deal with. We wonder, well, why, why is it that when I left my guilt at the cross that I'm still carrying this shame? It's because your identity, because your identity needs to be conformed into His image. It's because we must constantly remind ourselves who we are in Him. I love this, I love this. Going back to Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 28, or Matthew chapter 28, verse 10. Look at this. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. This is to Mary Magdalene and Mary the other Mary. He says, Do not be afraid. Listen, if you miss this, you'll miss it. He says, Go and tell my brothers. I want to stop right there. When Jesus walked with all of his disciples, he called them this. He called them servants. He called them followers. He called them disciples. He called them my beloved. But never did he call them brothers. It was not until he died and resurrected on that third day when he shows up to Mary and he shows up to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary that he says, go and tell my brothers. Because at his death, his burial, his resurrection, he went to hell. He took the keys of hell, death, and the grave. He restored the relationship that we now have with the Father. And now we are called sons and daughters of the living God, our identity was restored on that day. So Resurrection Sunday is more than just saying and proclaiming Jesus is risen. It is proclaiming that our restoration has come. That you and I are now made and conformed in the image of Christ because of what He did on the cross. We now can identify ourselves as brothers, as sisters, as those adopted and grafted into the body of Christ. We've been given the same rights as Christ. So he says, go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see. And there they will see. Listen. God wants to deal with our doubt. He wants to deal with our guilt. He wants to deal with our shame. Because there's more to the story. This is more than a story. This is more than just an account. This is, this is the experience that He wants you to have. That when we, when we deal with our doubt, when we deal with our guilt, when we deal with our shame, and listen, this is an ongoing process. This is what... This is exactly what what Paul has said in Ephesians, that he hasn't been perfected yet. He hasn't gotten there yet, but he's striving every day. Every day, I keep going to the cross. Every day, I I am coming to my Savior. Every day, I am relating to his resurrection. Every day, I present myself to Christ. Why? Because he has a purpose for you. So when we deal with our doubt, when we deal with our guilt, and when we deal with our shame, listen, God begins to launch us into a purposeful life. 
And what is that purposeful life? Matthew chapter 28. Look at what he says as he, as he ends this chapter, starting in verse 18. Starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Listen, go. I'm dealing with your doubt. Listen, doubt doesn't mean that we are apprehensive to step. Every doubt requires a step of faith. It's not a leap into the dark. There's a basis to our faith. Every, every faith has a basis. There, there is, there is, a, there is a, a common ground, something that is, is, it's a solid foundation. We have a foundation to our faith. As a matter of fact, when, when Paul addresses this issue in 2 Corinthians, he actually names three of the disciples who were there. They were still alive. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, he, sat, he names those three disciples, John and James, and he says, go to them and talk to them and ask them what they saw. They're still alive. As a matter of fact, there were 500 people who were there who had witnessed his resurrection, that had witnessed him after he had died and been rose, uh, risen again. There were, he presented him to himself to over 500 believers. Go talk to them. They will tell you that this thing is not false. It's not a story. This is real. They weren't hallucinating. They weren't in Colorado. They, you know, they, they were, they were, they, they had seen it. They had touched it. They had experienced it. Talk to them. There's a basis to your faith. He says, now, now that we've settled the issue of doubt, because we all doubt, in the middle of your doubt, go. Their doubt wasn't completely reconciled on that day. But he said, go. Their guilt, they would sin. As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Acts, you will be wildly amazed at how they, how they sinned. Man, they, they caused ruckus in the body. There was division that would take place. Then there would be reconciliation. Then there would be infighting then there would be reconciliation. Were they, were they perfect people? Absolutely not. But you know what? They dealt with their guilt. They confessed their sins to God. Was there shame? Absolutely. Absolutely. But Jesus already addressed their shame. He said, your identity is found in me. He says, your identity is found in me. But he says, even in the middle of all that, I want you to go and make other disciples. I want you to find others who are doubting, others who are guilty, others who have shame, and present them with this gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. All that I have commanded. And behold, listen to this. You struggle. You will struggle. You are struggling. But He's with you always. Even unto the end of the age. With every eye closed and every head bowed. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that today we can come before your presence and deal with our doubt, deal with our guilt, and deal with our shame. I thank you today that I can trust you, that you've set a foundation on which I can walk. That you set a that you set a way, a lifestyle, in which I can step into. 
I thank you that you don't wait till I'm perfect. It's, it's not what I do to get to where I need to be. I step to where I need to be so that I can do what you want, want me to be. I step into you. I step into your calling. I step into your arms. I seek your forgiveness today. I ask you to wash me and cleanse me and purify me. Not so that I can be good enough, but so that I can identify with you. So that I can be in relationship with you. See, some of us, we think we have to get it all right before He accepts us. And I want to tell you, He accepts you and then helps you get it all right. But all you have to do is confess. And if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He was raised from the dead, then you will be saved, you and your house. Is that you today? You're saying, Pastor, I've, I'm not where I need to be spiritually. My life of faith has not been where it needs to be today. And I want to reconcile this morning. I want to, I want to say to, I want to make a commitment to the Lord that moves beyond just Easter that moves into my everyday life. This is more than just a story. You want me to experience you. Pastor, I want to experience Christ like I've never experienced Him before. Is that you today? I want to pray with you. I want to believe with you. That God would help you to deal with your doubt, to deal with your guilt, and to deal with your shame. Just raise your hand right now. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Will you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I ask today to come and live in my heart, to take control of my life. Give me faith. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died and you raised again so that I might have life and life everlasting. So I ask today, forgive me of all of the things I'm guilty of and change my heart so that I can deal with my shame in you. That my identity would be found in you. 